Hello, Assalamualaikum and good morning you all. Uh, Dr. Yang is here. Uh, today's topic will be removable and fixed appliances. Uh, fixed appliances is also, is also known as braces. I hope you can focus on this topic because it's quite simple but then uh, the slides uh, are quite uh, a lot today. But I hope I can finish this, uh, finish this uh, lecture by one hour. This is the learning outcome of this lecture. Uh, it will be divided into two parts. The part one is uh, removable appliances and second one is the fixed appliances. For I hope you should be able to classify the types of appliances in orthodontics. And then I hope you should be able to identify the components of removable appliances. You should be able to outline the types of clubs, label bow, springs and the users. Uh, you also need to know the indication and contraindication of fixed appliances. You should know and identify the components of fixed appliances and uh, you should be able to discuss the basic principles of different techniques, for example, H-wise back and pre-adjusted H-wise appliances. These are the types of appliances in orthodontics. For today's topic is removable appliances and functional appliances or braces. You also already learned about myofunctional appliances or functional appliances and soon you will learn about orthopedic appliances. Okay, now we will focus first on removable appliances. What is removable appliances? A removable appliance are orthodontic device which can be taken out by the patient for cleaning and which are designed to apply forces to the teeth by means of spring and screws and other mechanical components. Uh, it, can be uh, it can be divided into location for, the, uh, for example, upper removable appliance for the upper arch and lower removable appliance for the lower arch. What are the advantages of the removable appliance? Because it is removable, it can be removed on socially sensitive occasion. Uh, for example, uh, if patient has a viva examination, for example, and they cannot uh, speak properly, so they can remove the removable appliances for a while, and then they need to put it on back uh, so that it can give it action for tooth movement. Secondly, patient can maintain good oral hygiene because uh, the appliance can be removed out during tooth brushing, during brushing the teeth, and then the appliance uh, can also be kept cleaned. It's also appealing to patient, especially adult, and it's cheap, it's easy to make and adjust, it's initially less chair, chair time and allow for some type of growth guidance. Now, what are the disadvantages? Because it's removable appliance, so it's really need a good patient compliance. A patient need to show a good cooperation in wearing the appliance to give a good effect. Uh, secondly, the disadvantages is uh, removable appliance is only capable for tipping movement, so it's not suitable to treat uh, some cases. And then, uh, lower removal appliances are not well tolerated. Why? Because we have tongue on the lower, so tongue will uh, influence in the retention of the lower removal appliance. Multiple rotation are very difficult to treat. And then, in extraction cases, it is difficult to close the residual spaces because it's only allowed tipping movement. So, the teeth will only tip into the spaces and it will not give a good result. And then there is also greater chance of appliance being misplaced and damaged. So some repair might need it. These are the components of removable appliances. The removable appliances are made up of three components. Uh, for We can use acronym ARAB or ARB, Arabs. First, active components. It compromise of spring, elastic and screws. Secondly, R for retentive. It's usually is uh, clubs. And then thirdly, B is base plate or framework that can be made of cold cure or heat cure acrylic. This is table 5. It shows the recommended wire diameters for removable appliance component. So we can see that we have two types of uh, measurement for wire diameters, which is in millimeter mm or gauge wire. Uh, usually in, in in our university, we use a gauge wire, 22 gauge wire, 24, 23. However, when you work in the government, uh, 
usually the technician will use a millimeter. So I hope you can be familiar with a millimeter, a both millimeter and gauge wire. So you can see that uh, for clubs, bigger clubs will use 0.7 mm or 32 gauge wire. However, smaller clubs uh, will use 0.5 mm and smaller uh, size. Now we will move into the active component, which uh, compromise of spring, elastic, and screw. What is spring? Spring are a part of the active components of removable orthodontic appliances used to bring about tooth movement. Uh, mainly, spring can be classified into two types. Firstly, based on the presence of helis. And secondly, based on the mode of support provided to maintain the integrity of the spring. For the first classification, the springs are based on the presence of helices. It's either simple spring or no spring at all, or helical spring or loop spring. So for simple spring, they doesn't have any helix present. And for compound spring, there is helix incorporated. And then for the helical springs, helix is present. And for loop spring, there is no helix, helix but a loop is included in the design. The second type of classification of spring is based on the mode of support provided to maintain the integrity of the spring. The first one is the self-supported spring. These springs are made of thicker wire to avoid distortion by the patient. And the second one is supported spring. And these springs are made of thinner wire and there is some support to protect this delicate spring. Now we will move into requirement of the spring. A good spring should be simple to fabricate, easily adjustable, uh, no discomfort to patient, be easily kept clean, apply forces of required magnitude, and can apply forces in required direction, be robust, be stable, meaning that it will not slip from the teeth, and it should move the teeth through the required distance. Okay, now we will move into uh, one of the important part in this topic, uh, factors to be considered when designing a spring. Uh, this part is uh is where examiner like to ask this question during viva during mcq even during your bds or, or your masters so i hope you can be uh have a focus on this uh, subtopic so we need to know three factors to be considered when designing a spring first the force to be applied second direction and type of tooth movement and third one is stability of the spring i will explain more later in our next slide the force F delivered by a spring is expressed by this formula, where D is the deflection of the spring when activated, R is the radius or diameter of the wire, and L is the length of the spring. Radius or diameter and wire length therefore have most effect on wire stiffness. Now we will look into the thickness, the radius or diameter of spring. According to the formula, if the diameter is doubled, the deflection and flexibility of a spring is decreased by 16 times. For example, a spring is made from thinner wire, generates less force and has greatly increased flexibility, thus remaining active over a longer period of time. Okay, now I want to stress out, uh, do you know what type of uh, material that is used for the wire? Okay, we use a stainless steel wire uh, of in removal appliance. And this wire, uh, we usually call 18-8 wire, where we use 18% uh, of chromium and 8% of nickel. I think you've already learned this in your dental material lecture. For the length of wire, doubling the length of the wire will increase the flexibility of the spring by 8 times and also reduce the force exerted. Increasing the length of wire, however, increases the range of action of the spring and therefore it is better to incorporate helices or loops into a spring which effectively increases its length within the limits of the appliance. A double helix provides further increase in flexibility by incorporating more wire in a given length of spring. 
Okay, now I would like to explain uh, types of spring available. We have Z spring, T spring, uh, robot retractor spring, and finger spring, and many more. First, we will start with finger spring. Finger spring consists of an active arm, 12 to 15 mm length towards the tissue. The helix of not more than 3 mm internal diameter and a retentive arm of 4 to 5 mm is kept away from the tissue to avoid any trauma uh, or ulceration and ends in a small retentive text. Uh, okay, uh, you already have done your practical in wire bending. Uh, so firstly, I want to stress out uh, that you need to increase the length of your spring by increasing the length from the teeth to the pilot. Uh, for, uh, most of you like to bend the retentive tag really short near the teeth. You need to like at least extend the retentive tag uh, for at least 4 to 5 mm uh, away from the gingival tissue. Okay. For maximum resilience, the coil should lie on the opposite side of the spring from the tooth so that it is bound up as the appliance is inserted and unwinds as the tooth moves. This is what we call bonds changer effect. How to activate the finger spring? The finger spring is activated by moving the active arm towards the teeth to be moved. So this photo shows the teeth and the finger spring is in passive. Uh, uh, the, the spring is still passive. So to activate the spring, we need to use a spring former plier or bird bit plier. This uh, both plier have uh, one uh, bit in rectangular shape and another one is in a round shape in cross section. What we need to do is we need to cream the helix so that the spring will move towards the teeth and then uh, in uh, when the, the 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 arm is moved towards the teeth is already activated and while we want to put the remover appliance back to the teeth we need to push back the arm and then put the arm to the side of the teeth so that it can exit the force Okay, the next type of spring is double cantilever spring. It's also known as Z spring because of the shape. It, sh it looks like Z shape. Uh, indication for this type of spring is uh, for the label movement of single incisor of bo or both uh, incisor and to bring about minor rotation. So how to construct uh, the double cantilever spring? We use a 0.5 mm hard round stainless steel wire and the spring consists of two coils very, which is very small in diameter. Uh, spring should be perpendicular to palatal surface of the tooth otherwise it tends to slip down and intrude it. Okay, make sure because uh, when uh, when I saw some of your uh, wire bending cases, uh, some of you doesn't put the spring perpendicular to the palatal surface. So make sure in order to exert the force properly, the spring should be perpendicular to the palatal uh, surface of the tooth. So now, how to activate the Z spring? So the Z spring usually is being put uh, at the uh, central incisor in order to procline the central incisor. So make sure the arm is situated at uh, perpendicular to the palatal surface of the incisor teeth. In order to activate, uh, firstly, we need to uh, we need to open the helices. The first helix, we need to open the arm so that it can push the incisor forward. And then after we push the arm on the first helix, and then we open the arm on another helix. So it will give force perpendicular to the palatal surface of the tooth. Then only the incisor teeth can procline. The next one is teeth spring. Teeth spring is used when a premolar or a canine has to be moved buckly. It is made from a 0.5 mm hard wire, stainless steel wire. Uh, spring consists of a T-shaped arm whose end are abandoned in acrylic. 
uh, the tea spring is activated by opening the loop of the tea spring. In order to do that, uh, we need to move the tea spring until the occlusal level of the the molar. So once we want to put it back, uh, we need to push down the tea spring so that the tea spring will situated uh, at the gingival level of the teeth. The next one is coffin spring. Coffin spring is introduced by Walter's coffin. It is a removable type of expansion spring. Coffin spring is used to bring about slow transverse dental alveolar arch expansion in case of unilateral crossbite. How to construct the coffin spring? It is made of a thick wire which is uh, around 1.25 mm hard standard steel round wire. It consists of U shape or a omega shape wire placed in the mid palatal region with retentive arm incorporated in the base plate. The retention is from the Adam clubs on the molar and the premolar. So now, how to activate the coffin spring? Four registration points are drilled at the extremities of base plate for recording the amount of expansion by the weather. By pulling the side apart manually, first in the premolar region and then in the molar region, activation of 1 to 2 mm at a time is appropriate. So this is uh, how we want to activate uh, the coffin spring. First, we need to expand uh, at the molar region. Sorry, we need to expand at the premolar region. How to how to do it is by expanding the loop at the blue arrow, and then after that, we need to expand at the molar region by expanding the loop at the premolar region. Canine retractor are springs that bring about distal movement of canine. The canine retractor can be classified as based on their location, based on design or based on mode of action. It can be based on their location at the buckle or palatal. It can be based on designs at the helical or loop or based on, uh, on mode of action at the push type or pull type. U loop canine tractors are made of 0.6 or 0.7 mm wire. It consists of U loop active arm and a retentive arm. The mesial arm of U loop is bent at the right angle and adapted around canine below its contact point. From the photo, we can see that the U loop should be 2 to 3 mm below the cervical margin to avoid trauma to the tissue. U, U loop canine retractor is used when minimal retraction of 1 to 2 mm is required. The activation is by closing the loop by 1 or 2 mm. Okay, this is our how to activate the canine retractor. We need to close, we need to crimp the loop so that it close around 1 to 2 mm and then, then only the canine can be moved distally. The next one is palatal canine tractor. It is made of 0.6 mm wire and consists of a coil of 3 mm active arm and retentive arm. The helix is placed along the long axis of the canine. It is indicated in retraction of palatally placed canine and activation is by opening the helix 2 mm at a time. Reverse loop buckle retractor is also known as helical canine retractor. It favored when the sulcus is shallow as in case of lower arch. It is made of 0.6 mm wire, consists of 3 mm diameter coil and active arm towards the tissue and a retentive arm. Mesial arm is adapted between the premolars. The distal arm is active, bent at right angles to engage canine below the height of contour. Coil is placed 3 mm below the gingival margin. How to activate the, the spring? It should not be activated more than 2 mm. It's done by cutting off 1 mm from free end and readapting. Alternatively, done by opening the helix by 1 mm. Buckle self supported canine retractor is constructed by 0.7 mm. Uh, wire. It is called self-supported because it is made of thicker diameter wire that resists distortion 
It consists of helix of 3 mm in diameter, an active arm and a retentive arm. The coil lies just distal to the long axis of tooth. The anterior limb passes down from the coil to the middle of the crown and passes around the mesial contact area. It is used in case of Buckley placed canine or in case of a canine placed high in vestibule. The features for this uh, spring is, is activated by closing the coil and then the active arm is away from tissue to avoid impingement of soft tissue and avoid trauma while the coil lies towards the tissue. Activation is by closing the helix. Okay, this is how to activate the buckle canine retractor. We need to close the helix so that the arm will push the teeth uh, into the arch. Okay, this is how we want to activate the spring. Okay, uh, this is uh, the difference between a supported buckle canine retractor and self-supported buckle canine retractor. In the first photo, it shows uh, the wire is thicker. Uh, so this is a self-supported buckle canine retractor. So the difference with the uh, supported buckle canine retractor is that the supported buckle canine retractor use a thinner wire and then they add a tubing. Tubing is uh, this uh, rectangular box uh, in blue color. The tubing, they insert the tubing uh, okay, inside the, the arm so that it can uh, strengthen uh, the arm uh, because in this type of tractor they use a thinner wire. Elastic is seldom used in removal appliance. It may be used for movement of single teeth or group of teeth and for intermaxillary traction. The use of intermaxillary elastic band was first described by Jackson in 1904. Their application was greatly advanced by introduction of arrowhead clubs and modification of Adam's clubs. Uh, both photos shows that intermaxillary elastic uh, with removable plates can be used for the treatment of class 2 and class 3, but it comes with several disadvantages. The disadvantages are it can slip gingivally and cause trauma to the, to the tooth, eh, sorry, to the soft tissue and then there is a risk of the arch form getting flattened and continuous immersion in saliva will cause a rapid force decay of elastic. The next one is orthodontic screw. Orthodontic screw is an active component of a removable appliances that together with acrylic plates can affect the teeth and ovular process. The screw was first introduced by Swatch. So what are the features of screw? It has an adequate amount of expansion, stability and minimum bulk. The expansion screw consists of a central body which is generally divided into two parts. The first part is holes and the second one is key. The central post portion is drilled with four holes which are equidistant so that the screw can be opened with the help of a key by a quarter turn each time. So what is the principle of screw expansion? The two, two screw portion are either side of the central boss portion are threaded in opposite direction. When the screw is open with the help of a key, the two halves move apart. Expansion is brought about by displacement of teeth within the limit of the periodontal ligament. The screw is designed in such a way that when opened by a quarter turn, it is less than the total width of the periodontal ligament and it will give around 0.15 to 0.3 mm expansion. The intermittent force allows remodeling changes to take place. The advantages of expansion screw are as follows. Many types of tooth movement are possible. Activation within physiological limits. Activation precisely controlled and simple. It applies large intermittent force, which decreases as the teeth move. Some disadvantages of the expansion screw are uh, they are bulky, expensive, and they may require under load and it requires patient cooperation to turn the screw. Uh, there are many types of expansion uh, can be offered by the screws. Uh, it can be put on the upper or lower uh, removal appliance and then the expansion can be anterior expansion or transverse expansion. So for the anterior expansion of 
arches is to correct the maxillary anterior crossbite. Uh, it's bring the base plate material up the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth to separate the teeth vertically and allow clearance for upper incisor to move up of crossbite. Uh, transverse expansions of arches is indicated in case of constricted maxillary arch. Active plate is split in the midline. It will expand the arch almost totally by tipping the posterior teeth buckly and not by opening the mid palatal suture. Because remember, uh, removal appliance is only allowed for tipping movement. So it won't cause any orthopedic changes, for example, opening mid palatal suture. For the next type of expansion, which is the simultaneously anterior and posterior arch expansion, it is possible to expand particularly in the maxillary arch by dividing the base plate into three rather than two segments. There is base on swatch original Y plate used simultaneously to expand the maxillary posterior teeth laterally and incisor anteriorly. Uh, but may, bear in mind, the more expansion screw in the remover appliance, uh, the less retentive it become. Okay, we are already done with the active components. Now we will move into the next part which is the retentive components, clubs. So what is the function of clubs? Clubs resist the displacement of orthodontic appliance by contacting the surface of the teeth or by engaging the undercuts. It can be divided into two types, which is the single arm clubs, which, uh, which is C and triangular clubs, and double arm clubs, which is U and Adams clubs. How does the clubs work? They act by engaging the constrictive areas of teeth called undercuts. There are two types of, of undercuts. The first one is buccal and lingual cervical undercuts. And the second one is the mesial and distal proximal undercuts. Uh, for the buccal and lingual cervical undercuts, usually these undercuts is utilized by using the circumferential club so that they can engage and get the retention from it. And then secondly, the mesial and distal proximal undercuts uh, where is being utilized by using the Adams clubs. The circumferential clubs is also known as C clubs or three quarter clubs. It's engaged the buccal cervical undercut and then the wire is engaged from one proximal undercut along the cervical margin, then carried over the occlusal margin to end as single retentive tag on the lingual side. So what is the advantages and disadvantages of this kind of clubs? The advantages is, is very simple in design and fabrication. However, it cannot be used in partially erupted teeth and it's made of thicker wire, hence very rigid and sometimes painful to patient. The next one is Jackson clubs. It was introduced by Jackson in 1906. It's also known as full clubs or U clubs. It's engaged the buccal cervical undercut and mesiodistal undercut. It is very easy to construct and have adequate retention. However, in partially erupted teeth, there is inadequate retention and may cause pain to patient. Adams clubs is the most commonly used clubs nowadays. It was described by Philip Adams and it was constructed using 0.7 mm hard stainless steel wire. There are three parts of the Adams clubs. The first one is the two arrowhead that will engage to the undercuts, the bridge between the two arrowhead and two retentive arm at the, at the lingual side to engage with the acleric. The two arrowhead engage the mesial and distal proximal undercuts. The arrowhead are connected to each other by a bridge which is at a 45 degree to the long axis of the tooth. Constructed Adam clubs should be passive but in contact with tooth surface when the appliance is fully inserted. There are several advantages of using Adam's club. 
it is rigid and offers axillary retention. It can be fabricated on both deciduous and permanent dentition. It can be used on partially or fully erupted teeth. It can be used on molars, premolars and incisors. There is no specific instrument needed to fabricate these clubs. It is small and occupies minimum space and clubs can be modified in a number of ways. There are three essential features of Adam clubs. The first one, the bridge is straight. The second one, the arrowhead are parallel and must not contact the adjacent tooth. Finally, the bridge stands away from tooth at an angle of 45 degree. There are a few modifications that we can do to the Adams clubs. The first one, Adams with a single arrowhead. It is indicated in the partially erupted tooth, usually the last erupted molar. The arrowhead is made to engage the mesoproximal undercut of the last erupted molar. Bridge is modified to encircle the tooth distally and ends on the palatal aspect as an attentive arm. These two photos shows that uh, the modification of the Adam clubs with J hook on the upper photo, where the J hook is being soldered and welded to the bridge, and the lower photo shows the Adams with incorporated helix, meaning that during the wire bending, uh, wire bending, the bridge uh, is being uh, uh, is being bended to create one helix, so that we can attach the elastic and many more things. This is the Adams you soldered buckle tube. Uh, the buckle tube is being soldered and welded uh, to the uh, bridge of the Adams club so that it can permit the use of extra or anchorage using the face bow where the head gear is assembled uh, together with the intra or appliance. The Adams clouds can also be modified uh, by adding the distal extension so that we can get an extra retention from the uh, tooth distal to the first molar. And then the lower photo shows that the Adams are on incisor and premolar for extra retention. Adams also can be modified uh, to be added with uh, some arrowhead. The additional arrowhead engages the proximal undercut of the adjacent tooth and is soldered onto the bridge. This offers additional retention. Triangular clubs is being introduced by Zimmer in 1949. It's used between two adjacent posterior teeth. It engages the proximal undercuts and is indicated when additional retention is needed. South end clubs is used for retention in anterior region. The wire is adapted along the cervical margin of both of the central incisor, and the distal end are carried over the occlusal embrasure on the pelter side as a retentive arm. For the ball ended clubs, it is usually used for additional retention where we already have the Adams clubs on the same uh, appliance. There are two types of uh, ball ended clubs. The first one is the custom made, and the second one is the preform wires. For the custom made, the ball can be made at the end of the wire using a silver solder, and the preform wires having ball at one end is also available in the market. Uh, this is how the ball and its gloves works. The ball engages the proximal undercut between two posterior teeth. Uh, there are some modifications can be made at the ball and its gloves. The first one, the ball clubs in the form of C's clubs, and the second one is ball clubs with extended arm, as shown in the photo. The next one is the eyelet clubs. It can be single, double, or continuous. The eyelet is formed without sharp bands, so breakage is unlikely. The next one is the Delta Clubs. It's being introduced by Clark in 1985, usually for the retention of the classic twin block appliance. It is a one kind of modification of the Adams Clubs, where the retentive loops are in shape of closed triangle. The advantages of this uh, Delta, Club, uh, Delta Clubs is it does not open with repeated insertion and removal. The next one is Dyson Clubs. This is a very rarely used clinically nowadays. It is made by two wires emerging from the plate to across the occlusion over the anterior and posterior contact point of the tooth clubs. Then, each wire goes above the greatest circumferences of the tooth to the middle of the tooth and back again below using the undercut. The next one is Crozet Clubs. It resembles a full clubs but has an additional piece of wire soldered which engage into the medial and proximal undercut. It offers better retention than full clubs. 
For the Arrowhead clubs, uh, is being introduced by AM Swash in 1935. There are three parts of uh, the Arrowhead clubs. The first one is the Arrowhead portion, and then the vestibular portion, and finally the retentive arm. The next one is the label bow. This is uh, the most commonly used uh, clubs for retention other than the Adams clubs. There are four parts of the label bow. The first one is the incisor segment. Second one is the vertical loops. The third one is the crossover section. And finally, the retentive arm. Okay, this is the incisor segment of the label bow. Usually, it's in the junction of the middle third and uh, incisor third. The right angle bend at the distal third of lateral incisors or mesial third of canine and is in contact only the most prominent teeth. For example, for the upper label bow, usually in contact with the upper central incisors and the canine because the upper lateral incisor is usually situated a bit palatally. And then for the lower label bow, usually in contact with uh, all lower incisor teeth. Uh, for the vertical loops, it consists of parallel vertical leg joined by a smooth curve. It's usually 9 to 12 mm, extending 2 to 3 mm above the gingiva margin. This is to avoid the gingiva trauma. And at the gingiva level, the loop is 1 to 1.5 mm away uh, from the tissue. And then uh, you can have a look at, at the photo. Actually, uh, the band uh, can be done uh, a bit distal to the midpoint of the canine. Uh, in this photo, uh, personally, I think it will cause uh, trauma to patient. What you need to do is we need to extend the 90 degree band a bit to the distal of the midpoint of the canine. And then uh, the loop uh, should be uh, away from the gingiva. Uh, 1 to 1.5 mm, mm away and then to extend 2 to 3 mm above the gingiva margin. Uh, this photo shows the crossover section of the label bow where the wire travels uh, from the label side of the teeth to the palatal side of the teeth. What are the uses of label bow? It usually uh, used to move teeth lingually after being activated. There is also have restraining action on lips. It also can act as a port for solid spring, bar loops or for hooks to attach elastic band. And the friction of the label wire against the anterior teeth act as clubs to enhance the fit of the plate. There are various types of, of label bow. The first one is the short label bow and then long label bow, split label bow, reverse label bow, Roberts retractor, Miss retractor, high label bow with ap apron spring and fitted label bow. I will explain uh, these types of bow in the next slide. The first one is the short label bow. It's constructed using 0.7 mm stainless steel wire. The retentive arm is distal to canine. It is very stiff and adds a bit low flexibility. The indication for short label bow is for minor over overjet reduction, for anterior space closure and for retention. How to activate the short label bow is by compressing the U loops. This occlusal uh, in front photo shows the short label bow. It shows that the wire is extended from the canine area from the right side to the left side and then the retentive arm is extended to the rugi area to give better adaptation and retention to the plate. The next one is the long label bow. Uh, the indication is it is used for minor anterior space closure, minor overjet reduction, closure of space distal to canine, the guidance of canine during retraction and of course for retention. There is the split label bow. Uh, it is the, a split in the middle of two separate buckle arm having U-loop. There is to increase flexibility. Uh, indication for the split label bow is for the anterior retraction and modified form for closure of midline destima. How to activate the label bow is by compressing the U loop 1 to 2 mm at a time. Okay, this photo shows the cases with midline decima. In this case, uh, what we do is we put a split label bow and then after we activate it, the patient will wear the appliance and then finally the midline destima will be closed in few months. This is reverse label bow. The U loops are placed distal to the canine. The free ends of the U loops are adapted occlusally between first premolar and canine. The indications are similar to short label bow, which is for the entry re reduction and for the object reduction. 
This is a high label bow with apron spring. It consists of a heavy wire label bow 0.9 to 1 mm that extends into the buckle vestibule. The apron spring is made of 0.4 mm wire or attached. It's used uh, in retraction of one or more teeth and in cases of large object. The apron spring is activated by bending in towards the teeth around 3 mm. Uh, the, the advantages of this type of label bow with apron spring is there is a difficulty in construction and there is a risk of soft tissue injury that will cause ulceration. Okay, the last one is the fitted label bow. The label bow is adapted one by one to the contours of the label surface and it's used only as a retainer to maintain the tooth position. Okay, we already done with the, the other two components of the removal appliance which is the active components and the retentive components. The third component is the base plate. So what is the base plate? Base plate is the framework of the removal appliance. It used to unite all components of the appliance into one unit. It helps in anchoring. It provides supports for wire components and it helps in distributing the forces over a large area. An anterior or posterior bike plane can be incorporated. Uh, this is the maxillary plate. The maxillary base plate usually covers the entire palate till the distal of the first molar. There is the mandibular plate. It's quite uh, different with the maxillary plate because we have tongue in the middle. So we need to relieve the acrylic uh, plate uh, at the tongue area to give way for the tongue. As I said before, the bite plates can be incorporated into anterior and posterior bite plane. So what is the uh, uh, what is the anterior bite plane? Anterior bite plane is required for overbite reduction and are made behind the incisor and canine. The bite plane should be flat and not inclined. This is to ab avoid the lower incisor to become proclined. The thickness should be sufficient to open the bite in the promolar region by 4 to 5 mm. And as the overbite reduces, the additional acrylic can be added to raise the platform and continue overbite reduction. What are the modifications for the anterior bite plane? The incisors may be capped to prevent their supra eruption or flaring. So what is the posterior bite plane? Posterior bite plane is used mainly when the teeth have to be pushed over the bite. For example, in cases with anterior cross bite where the upper incisor is situated behind the lower incisor. So posterior bite plane is used uh, to, to free the bite so that the upper incisor can be proclined forward to get positive object. So the height of the platform should be sufficient enough to free the teeth that are to be moved or, or proclined from the occlusal interference with the opposing teeth. In order to make the base plate, there are two materials can be used which is the heat cure and the self cure. For the heat cure, they have more color stability, less porosity and the strength is better than the self cure. For the self cure, it's very convenient, it's very easy to manipulate, uh, it's a uh, the curing is faster than the heat cure and then it is more cost effective and possible for repair. For self-cure acrylic, the steps are as follows. Firstly, the cast is coated with separating medium. Secondly, all the components are secured in position using pink wax. Parts of the spring which must not be borne up in the base plate material are covered in pink wax. Otherwise, it will all be covered by the acrylic. Okay, there are two ways to apply the self-cure acrylic. The first uh, technique is single mix technique, meaning that the monomer and polymer are mixed together and then are being applied uh, to the cups. And then second technique is salt and pepper or sprinkle on technique. Uh, after the acrylic is fully cured, then the appliance is trimmed and polished. 
So now, what is the advantages of the clear acrylic resin? The advantages is the blanching of the tissue can be seen. Blanching meaning that uh, there is a high spot uh, from the acrylic that impinge the gingiva. So it's easily for us to detect the area and then we can trim off the area so that it won't cause a traumatic ulceration for patient. And the second advantage is that any entrapment of food can be observed. Okay, now once the appliance is ready to be issued to patient, what we should check? Firstly, we need to check the previously described design has been made correctly by the technician. We need to check the appliance for any sharp edges or any roughness. We need to trim the acrylic base for proper fit and then adjust the spring, test the functioning of the screw, check the clubs and check for any sharp edges and soft tissue impingement. So if you are using clear acrylic base, we can see the blanching and then that's uh, the sign of soft tissue impingement. Okay, once we successfully uh, issued the appliance for patient, uh, what should we instruct the patient? Firstly, the patient should be shown in the mirror the insertion and removal of the appliance. Insist that the appliance be maneuvered by the bridge of the clubs and not the label bow or spring because it may cause distortion of the label bow and spring. Patients should be instructed to wear the appliance for 24 hours a day and to remove the appliance only while brushing and also during contact sport and swimming. A high standard of oral hygiene should be insisted upon to avoid the possibility of enamel decalcification. The patient should be instructed to clean the appliance by brushing it with soap and water. Care should be taken while cleaning so that it's not to bend or to distort any components. In case of pain or appliance damage, uh, we must, uh, may ask the patient uh, to report immediately to the clinic or to call for an appointment. Patient having an appliance with screw should be given instruction on how to activate the screw. Patient should be instructed not to leave the appliance out of the mouth for a long period of time as it may enhance the chances of it getting damaged or distorted. Care should be also be taken to keep the appliance away from pet animals and when the, an when the appliance is not being worn. Okay, after that, we will give an uh, appointment every few weeks, every six weeks or every two months uh, for review. So, what to check for each a written visit. So firstly, inquire if the appliance has been comfortable. Patient asks to remove and insert the appliance. So if patient can remove and insert the appliance easily, means that the compliance is good from patient. Because if patient doesn't wear the appliance correctly, uh, he or she are unable to remove or and insert the appliance properly. And then we also need to check for any facet wear upon acrylic and even breakage. We need to check for amount of tooth movement, check for any trauma uh, or impingement of the soft tissue. And then we should reschedule the next appointment around four weeks interval. Okay, this is an uh, instruction on how to uh, fit a removal appliance from the textbook. Firstly, we need to check that the working model and appliances are those of the patient and that the appliance has been well made to your design. Check the fitting surface for roughness and any sharp edges of wire tacks. This should be smoothened off with an acrylic burr or green stool respectively. Try the appliance in the patient's mouth. If any teeth have been lost or extracted since the impression was taken, some adjustment is likely to be required to get the appliance to fit well. Adjust the posterior and then the anterior retention until satisfactory. Trim any anterior or posterior bike plane to the correct height. Leave all spring passive for the first two weeks until the patient has adapted uh, to wearing the appliance. This is uh, because we want to check, uh, we want to test for the patient compliance. Once patients show good compliance and cooperation, then only we will activate activate the springs. This is because once we activate the spring, uh, patient will feel some uh, soreness to the teeth and then this may affect their compliance later. 
And then number seven, show the patient in the mirror how to insert and remove the appliance. Stressing that it is important not to damage any spring. Let the patient practice this several times under your supervision. Instruct the patient and parents or guardian in wear and care of the appliance, emphasizing the following. Firstly, full-time wear, including meal times, is essential. It will take a few days to get used to eating with the appliance, but you must persevere. Sticky and hard foods, particularly toffees and chewing gum, must not be eaten. The appliance must be taken out after meals for cleaning and for contact spot. Speech is likely to be affected for the first week, but it will be normal thereafter. If the appliance cannot be worn as instructed or causing discomfort or breaks, patients should contact the clinic immediately. Number 9. Explain that the appliance has been fitted passively and that any extraction will be requested once there is evidence of full-time wear. Uh, this is the case where extraction is needed. And then number 10. Make a review appointment for 2 to 3 weeks. The review appointment will depend on what type of the appliance. Okay, uh, For the active appliance, first uh, review, we need to get a uh, 2 to 3 weeks a review uh, to check for the compliance and after that, uh, four weeks uh, interval review. For subsequent visits, we need to check uh, the compliance sign. What is the sign of the compliance? Meaning that we need to check for the sign whether the appliance is being worn full time or not. Firstly, the speech should be normal with no lisping. The patient should be able to remove and insert the appliance without uh, using a mirror. And then the base plate should have lost its shine. If there is an anterior or posterior bike plane on the appliance, this should be occlusal marking from the opposite teeth, mild gingival erythema and a slight mark across the posterior extent of the appliance on the palate should be present. If full-time wear is not apparent, the patient should be questioned as to why and inform that treatment will be terminated unless total compliance is good. Check for oral hygiene of the patient. Check for anchorage loss by recording the buckle segment relationship and the overjet. If headgear is being worn, ask if there are, have been some problem. And then document all, uh, all complaints by the patient. And then check for evidence of headgear wear and for how long it uh, worn by patient. Assess the intended tooth movement, record any changes, adjust the retention if necessary, check the base plate so that there is no impingement to the tooth and then there is no impediment to the movement of the teeth. Adjust the active component if necessary and indicate in the patient records the action plan for the next visit. Okay, the previous slide is the end for the removable appliance. Now we will move into fixed appliances. Uh, so there is only a few slides on fixed appliance because at your level, uh, you need to know uh, just the important part of the fixed appliance. And if you want to know more about fixed appliances, you, you need to further study in your master degree. Uh, so that uh, you can know better about fit suppliers and can put braces for patient. At the end of this lecture, you all should be able to outline the indication and contraindications of fit appliances. You also should be able to identify the components of fit appliances and you should be able to discuss the basic principles of different techniques which is H-wise, back and pre-adjusted H-wise appliance. These are the content of the lecture. I will start with introduction. What is fit orthodontic appliances? It is a now, what are the indications for fixed appliances? Fixed appliances, however, in some cases, fixed appliances or braces. Components of fixed appliances. Fixed appliances consist of... Components of fixed appliances can also be divided into two, which is active components and passive components. The active components... Uh, the first one is ash wires. There are many types of ash wire, which is stainless steel, nickel titanium wire, cobalt chromium nickel wire, 
TMA which is titanium molybdenum wire, gold wire and optiflex wire. The other types of active components are power chains, elastic, separators and spring. Power chains are used to move teeth in the same arch. Elastic is used to move the teeth in different arch, while separators are used to separate two teeth together and it can be seen in two types which is standard steel separators and elastomeric separators and finally the spring. The spring is used to torque the teeth. Elastic can be used in many ways. Firstly, it can be used as box elastic where it is used in the anterior open bite cases. The box elastics will extrude the upper and lower front teeth in order to close the bite. Cross elastic is used in a patient with posterior cross bite in order to get a good occlusion at the back. In class 3 elastic, it is used in a class 3 my occlusion in order to get a positive overjet. Uh, in these cases, the elastic will move the lower dentition backward and it will move the upper dentition forward. In a class 2 elastic, it is used in the cases in order to move the upper dentition backward and to move the lower dentition forward in order to correct the overjet. This is closed coil spring and open coil spring. Both are the active components of the fixed appliances. Closed coil spring, as the name is closed, so the function is to close the space. While open coil spring is to open up the space so that we can align a teeth. So this is a very simple concept. Okay, the next one is a passive component. The passive components are bands, bucket tubes, and brackets. These are the examples of passive components used to secure wires onto brackets. The first one is lock pins, second one is steel ligatures, and the third one is elastomeric ligatures, or sometimes we call it as module. These are the type of brackets according to the system which is either back brackets, edgewise bracket and tip edge brackets. These are the brackets according to the material used to made up the brackets. Firstly is the metal brackets, secondly is the gold brackets, thirdly is the ceramic or plastic brackets and finally is the lingual brackets which are metal brackets which are being placed at the lingual surface of the teeth. These are the three main stages of fixed appliances. Stage 1 is level. The next subtopic is the history of fixed appliances and their age-wise appliances use horizontal slot in bracket. Tooth movement is achieved by bodily movement and it uses a lot of wire bending to achieve final tooth position. It required adjustment of arch wire in three plane which is up and down tip and talk. Precision in tooth positioning is achieved in finishing stage via bands. This age-wise appliance is largely replaced by pre-adjusted age-wise system or also known as straight wire appliances. Bad appliances based on the use of differential force method by using light forces and tipping teeth. Brackets has vertical slot in which ash wire is secured with brass pin. There are three stages of treatment. The first stage is aligning teeth, correct incisor and molar relationship, cross bite and rotation by achieving an edge to edge anterior bite. Second stage is space closure and to maintain stage 1 correction and the final stage is to correct the inclination of the teeth. 
mode of action of back appliances. Back bracket design allowed teeth to freely tip. This freedom of tooth movement allowed correction of large overbite and overjet to an H2H -H position and rapid closure of extraction spaces. Finally, individual tooth root correction was managed by using light elastic force and other tooth moving axillaries, for example, uprighting springs. Advantages of bed appliance are there is a lack of friction, free tipping, light force, speedy tooth movement and minimal wire bending. However, the, the disadvantages are emphasis on extraction, so we still need to do extraction in a bed technique, reliance on elastic, lack of precision and all tooth correction had to be completed simultaneously because there is no parts of the bracket to stop tooth movement or hold corrected teeth in their corrected position. And then this back appliance is largely replaced by tip H. The next kind of uh, system is a straight wire appliance or pre-adjusted H-wise appliance. In 1972, Andrews examined 120 non-authentic normals and identified the ideal features of the normal static occlusion. He modified the H-wise appliances and then developed the straight wire appliances which pre-programmed the bracket with average value for thickness, tip and top of clinical crown. There are two kinds of slot size in a straight wire appliance bracket which is uh, 1828 and 2228. There are three types of prescription, bracket prescription for the straight wire appliance, which is the Andrews, Roth, and MBT. The advantages of the straight wire appliances are it reduces wire bending since it's a straight wire concept and it allows sliding mechanics and good finishing. However, the the disadvantages are it ignores biological variability and it increases frictions, hence increased anchorage requirement. The straight wire appliances differed from the standard H-wise appliances in a number of innovation. Firstly, each bracket was customized for each tooth type, meaning that the bracket for incisor is different from the bracket for premolar. Pre-angulated slot for mesodistal tooth tip. The bases of the brackets are inclined to achieve proper torque. The bases are contoured vertically and horizontally. The distance from bracket base to slot base. Built-in guidance minimizes the arch wire manipulation. The guidance features are pre-programmed to promote better occlusal goals. Bracket design facilitates accurate bracket placement. Extraction brackets are available which is uh, providing anti-tip and anti-rotation and each bracket carries its own identification. Advantages of fixed appliances. It provides bodily tooth movement and precise 3D controls of tooth movement. It can be used in complex malocclusion. It can be used in cases with high anchorage requirement. Control space closure is possible. We can incorporate multiple tooth movement in one arch. It can be used in upper and, low and lower arch. It's easier to correct rotation and not dependent on compliance for wear. However, there are a few disadvantages of fixed appliances. Firstly, oral hygiene can be problematic. If the patient cannot maintain a good oral hygiene throughout orthodontic treatment, uh, it may increase the risk of decalcification on the labial surface of, surface of the teeth. Secondly, there will be a long chest time for orthodontists. And thirdly, a clinician requires extensive training in order to put a fixed appliances to patient. In order to be a qualified orthodontist, you must undergo a four-year full-time master training in a recognized university. In Malaysia, uh, University of Malaya and University Kebangsaan Malaysia offers a master training in orthodontics. Uh, in overseas, there are four countries that are recognized by Malaysia to offer master training in orthodontics, which is United Kingdom. Australia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. 
You also must have a competent knowledge and qualification in orthodontics before fitting a fixed appliances to patient. And please, please, please remember, do no harm to patient. Make sure you have an extensive training before you fix uh, braces to your patient. Okay, finally, this is the last slide of this lecture. As a recap, uh, you should be able to classify types of appliance in orthodontics. You should be able to identify the components of removable appliance. You should be able to outline the type of clubs, label bow, spring and their users. And you should be able to outline the indication and contract indication of fixed appliances. You should be able to identify the components of fixed appliance and you should be able to discuss the basic principle of different techniques such as age-wise back and pre-adjusted each wise appliance so thank you very much for your cooperation so uh, uh, I think this is the the longest lecture that I've given to you it takes about one hour and three minutes uh, thank you for your time I hope you can uh, understand this topic uh, it is quite important for your exam and for your knowledge thank you so much uh, have a great day ahead